Stephen, how are you? Thanks for joining us. Josh, it's a pleasure to be here. You're coming to us from Brooklyn, if I understand? Beautiful Brooklyn, New York. That's right. Awesome. I see the train in the background. Very cool. That's right. Um, it's not delayed for once. Yeah, it's not delayed. Just want to put that out there. That's because it's probably uh, Zoom probably provided you that fake background. It's just on a loop. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I'm actually in the Bahamas, actually. So <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. You have a better green screen than I ever can. Um, <laughs> Well, we are excited to have you, and, and I've just been talking about how important it is to understand some of the key aspects that a brand needs to know or pillars to know whether they're ready to go cross-border and how they should, if their foundation is ready and what's needed. Obviously, Easy Ship already has a solution, and I understand there's a bunch of different pillars for it, and this is not about Easy Ship per se, but it is about helping merchants understand, and fashion brands in particular, how, what is out there for them? How much do they really have to do themselves? And Easy Ship has a solution where you can sell globally, um, mm -hmm. but you can do that in incremental ways. We'll talk about that maybe later, but let's dive into the pillars of that, that incremental cross-border logistics uh, foundation. Sure. Okay, so we're starting first with some of the key questions to ask yourself to know if you're ready to grow cross-border sales. Yeah, this is an excellent question, Josh. I think some of the key questions that a merchant needs to ask is number one, how many couriers are they using uh, to ship internationally? So as we all know, shipping costs, conversion costs, they're inversely related. And what that means is it's just simply the higher the shipping costs, the less likely that conversion is going to happen. And um, that courier assortment is going to be crucial from an international solution standpoint. So, for example, your FedEx rates might be really great for your UK customers, but they're not going to be, maybe they're not the best for your, your, your customers in Spain or in Brazil or in Israel. So having kind of multi-couriers like an Aramax, an APC, regional couriers, other couriers like UPS, DHL, postal sol solutions, having that whole lot is going to help a merchant ship internationally more cost effectively and much more optimized. Um, so there's plenty of, of different technology partners out there that provides a lot of these solutions. With Easy Ship, we've invested an enormous amount of time and resources building this network. So we allow our merchants to have about six, 60 different courier partners at their, at their fingertips to, to ship to all over the world. Yeah, that's interesting. Obviously, when I, I talk about companies all the time, like today's world, it's not hard to get your product from A to Z. It's hard to do it at a cost that is not prohibitive. And then ultimately, it's hard to build your brand. But that's a, a separate section. Uh, but if you're talking about the consumer experience now, obviously, again, show us more. How, how do you set that up so that the consumer has a, a fluid experience on the site? Yeah, totally. So with EasyShip, we provide a dynamic checkout. Um, so one of the big key points of this whole thing is that, you know, you can have, you know, 60 different couriers, but if you don't have the technology to, to sort them out, to figure out, hey, look, customer A from China or customer C from Israel, what is the best solution to ship to them out of the, the many different solutions that we have? So having an assortment of, of couriers is just one part of the equation. Having the technology to find the best solution is the next part of that equation. Um, and there are plenty of technology partners that will help kind of figure out what that best solution is depending on where that customer's address is, that country, et cetera. Um, and what we find that, that works the best is having that specific algorithm that when we pull that order in, we can automatically start applying what the best, that best solution is, whether it's DHL, whether it's APC, whether it's a postal solution, et cetera. That's particularly great, obviously, for the small and medium companies. They're not going to be able to get uh, that, that visibility, that awareness. They don't have the, the, the engagements. Maybe they have one deal with one courier, but you need to be able to pull from, from the different solutions in a way where, frankly, you don't even want to have to deal with it, but you do want to have a solution that does. That's cool. Thanks, Stephen. That's one of the things that I, I think we've been talking about a lot in this series, which is at the end of the day, people have to understand, especially U.S. companies that are traditionally selling to U.S. consumers, the cross-border consumer is much more hypersensitive to that experience throughout the flow because they're evaluating constantly. Do I trust this brand? Do I feel like they're exactly. going to be behind me? What if I want to return something? Are they going to be there? Now, you know, return rates, I guess, are a lot smaller for cross-border, but 
that's also the barrier because people don't want to return. So they really need to make sure that they have that trust early on. Right. That's right. And that's conveyed a lot in the, in the checkout. Right. Yeah, that's right. And, and also, I, I think what we found out is that once you kind of display taxes and duties at checkout, uh, a lot of merchants kind of they feel like this is going to reduce their conversion rate. Um, but actually, we found out that it's the opposite. Primarily because of what you said, there's trust behind that, uh, and then on top of that, global merch, uh, global customers will start understanding like this brand actually knows what's going on in my country, so therefore, I'm more willing to purchase this product. Yeah, that's interesting. That's a fascinating uh, kind of find there in terms of what you're seeing with the data is that being overly communicative, even if the news isn't great news, uh, builds trust. So the, the question, I guess, on that side is, can we talk about DDP and DDU, delivery duties paid, delivery duties unpaid? Do you offer both options and can the consumer choose? And what are you seeing are the trends? And is it the same for every country? Yeah. Um, so on that question in terms of what DDP and what DDU is, uh, DDP is simply duties delivered prepaid. And what that means is that the taxes and duties are prepaid before the shipment is sent. So your customer doesn't need to worry about things when they receive uh, that package uh, at their door. Duties delivered unpaid or DDU is the exact opposite. What that means is that you send it without prepaying the taxes and duties. And the customer, when they receive it, then fronts the bill for that. Um, and you know, a lot of times, a lot of people ask us in terms of what's the best experience for this? Uh, should I do it all DDP? Should I do it all DDU? And the answer that I would like to give is that you should just have them decide. Um, there are solutions out there now, um, including Easy Ships, that where the customer can decide which solution fits what they're looking for. So if a customer wants to pay for DDP, they can. If they don't want to pay for DDP and they want to do a DDU solution, they can as well. And that's going to be the most important piece of e-commerce shipping. I mean, shipping related to e-commerce is empowering your customers to make those decisions. Um, the other thing I've noticed is consumers, for example, I've heard in Hong Kong, for example, some of them won't choose DDP. And from a merchant's perspective, I always thought, well, you should always do DDP. It's much easier for the consumer, but some consumers say, no, no, because I actually have a way to get around that, or I don't think that they're going to, the rate of investigation or customs, you're actually opening packaging up is so low, I'm willing to take the risk. That, one of the things that happen? Yeah, I mean, it, it varies between country to country. Every country is different. As you can imagine, every country's setup is different. The, 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 the amount of efficiency between governments are different between different countries. So for that specific point, I would say it's not untrue, but uh, rolling the dice is very dangerous. However, what I would say is this is also another reason why we've provided um, or what we've seen now is people are seeing multiple options at their checkout, one with taxes uh, being prepaid and one with uh, DDU. Um, and the idea is that if a customer is like, hey, look, I, I order all the time. I know that I can roll the dice here and I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to avoid taxes and duties. Let them make that decision and, and be out of that kind of conversation because, frankly, I don't know how it is in Albania uh, versus another country. So let's talk about what you should consider when vetting the proper fulfillment company to help you scale internationally. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think that the three things that I would say that a brand should look at when they're kind of looking for a fulfillment partner, um, especially one that can help them scale internationally, is, is three things. Number one, the assortment of couriers. International location for global uh, scalability. And then the third is flexibility on logistics solutions. And I'll, I'll explain to you that third one because I'm sure a lot of people are kind of raising their eyebrows a little bit on that one. Um, so many fashion brands that we've kind of been working with, they're, they're doing a lot of pre-orders. They're doing a lot of like flash sales where they have a lot of volume um, to a particular region because they're, they're collecting all these pre-orders at a given time. 
So that logistics flexibility is going to be incredibly important because it helps drive down the cost by building you a solution where you're using that volume, bulk shipping it into multiple different, uh, different regions and then handing it off to a local courier. Not a lot of fulfillment centers out there do that, but there are plenty of fulfillment centers that do do that. And it's really important, especially if you're a fashion brand that has high volumes, that has plans to do flash sales, that has maybe success with flash sales before or pre-order campaigns, to really look at solutions that have this because it helps drive down costs for shipping dramatically while increasing your, your customer experience. Steven, how do you reduce your costs in logistics when you're manufacturing in China, for example? Um, I think the first thing that people need to think about when it comes to logistics costs is that a lot of people are manufacturing in China. The most optimal port in China is still Hong Kong. Hong Kong is home to one of the biggest uh, international airports, actually not one of the biggest, the biggest international airport in the world. It, it, you know, basically it's the biggest cargo airport. You can look it up on Wikipedia. It's, in, it's insane how, how, how much cargo goes through that every year. Um, so moving kind of inventory towards there, optimizing your shipping rates from, from Hong Kong is going to be incredibly wise for any kind of merchant looking at reducing logistics costs to shipping it um, worldwide. Um, another piece of this um, is actually related to tariffs. Now this tariffs, um, Trump tariffs are still very much in effect. And by all accounts um, in the industry, it doesn't look like Biden's kind of reviewing that just yet as he has bigger things to kind of deal with, especially around COVID. Um, and just to kind of give you an example of you know, bag manufacturers uh, that are manufacturing out of China are facing an additional 25% tariff on top of their 20% duty rate. So that's a that's around a that's more than a 40% uh, import um, duty slash tariff rate if you were to ocean freight that those goods into the United States with uh, shipping it directly to your customers. Um, like moving them down to Hong Kong and shipping them directly to your customer in the U.S., you fall under a, a, a certain th a threshold that the United States have, which is $800. If you're shipping a package that is under $800 to a customer, then you, as well as your customer, uh, do not need to pay any taxes, duties, or tariffs. Um, and what we've seen with merchants that um, we've worked with is this saves them enormously uh, especially if they're a bag manufacturer, if they're kind of if they fall into that kind of high tariff zone uh, with kind of luxury goods that aren't over eight hundred dollars, but not, you know it, it still costs them a little bit of money to kind of manufacture. This is a this is a very very good way to kind of reduce that tariff load for them. So you're seeing a lot of customers you're saying that are actually fulfilling from their Hong Kong warehouse direct to consumers or from your Hong Kong warehouse, let's say direct to consumers in the US if they're under the $800 minimus, which is the name that that would be called. Is that accurate? Exactly. 100%. This is particularly cool. I need to highlight this because a lot of companies don't realize this and the bigger ones do. So essentially, if you are importing, I'm going to say again, if you're importing goods under $800 to an individual consumer, you do not have to pay duties and taxes. So that whole trade war thing doesn't apply, right? That's but right. If, so if you hit over that amount, you do. However, a lot of companies in the US, a lot of fashion brands importing in bulk. And then when it hits the US, they start to do pick, pack, labeling and shipping direct to consumer. If you can somehow get advanced awareness or start to really understand your customer and, and anticipate their purchasing, and you could put product in a warehouse in Hong Kong label it for the end consumer and import it pre-labeled for the consumer and you do avoid those tariffs you can still take advantage of larger bulk logistics uh fees that break into the us that's right you start looking at things much more strategically and and you know with a lot of these um kind of smaller brands um it's not complicated to do it, it um so it by kind of just kind of looking at different solutions like, uh, you know, uh, the threshold of being $800 can save uh, companies huge amounts of money um, just because they don't need to pay that tariff that uh, or duties when they get into uh, importing it into the United States.
Steve, could you just articulate a little further into that? The $800 minimus, is that per order? Is that per week? And is that per item? Yeah, it's, a, it's an $800 threshold uh, per customer per day. And that's the law. Yeah. That's excluding uh, logistics costs and taxes or? Yes, exactly. Excluding okay. logistics costs and taxes. It's just with the, the value of the retail good. Okay, great. Thank you. So Stephen, if I'm a merchant in, let's say throughout the EU, uh, let's say Germany, France, et cetera, and I want to ship to the US, I can use, for example, Easy Ship. You have a network of warehouses both in the EU that I could ship through and you would take it from there, or I could ship all the way to a US fulfillment center that you have in the US, correct? Exactly. 100%. Or you can use our cloud technology. So if you're a merchant in the UK, uh, you can actually sign up for Easy, Easy Ship, print out the labels and ship them out. So talk us through really quick. If I go from Instagram and I click the buy button as a consumer and I go over to my website, what do I need on my own website to be optimized for cross-border sales? Yeah. So having a uh, checkout that displays taxes and duties. Um, and also providing options, um, whether it's the cheapest, best value, and the fastest solution through an assortment of different couriers, but more importantly, offering the option of, of prepaying taxes and duties for those, those customers of yours internationally as well. That's awesome. So essentially, you can use solutions like EasyShip that are already integrated into big commerce, click a few buttons, get your site optimized for cross-border, and then start selling on Instagram Shopple Media. That's right. Stephen, that's super important. Thank you for breaking that down for us. And we will see you soon on the road. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Josh.